Hello, everyone. Welcome to the China Brief. We bring you the latest global media coverage on China's current affairs, economy, and society, as well as exclusive analysis. Our trustworthy, professional, and multi-perspective China reporting provides judgment and decision-making references for the world's elites. The China Brief is issued in multiple languages, including text, video, podcasts, and books, and is broadcasted 24/7 in the six-degree world. Welcome to this edition of China Briefing. In China Briefing, we bring you the latest news on China's politics, economy, and society from the global media, as well as exclusive expert analysis. If you find our content helpful, please subscribe to our newsletter. The missing pillars of Japan's economic growth. These three pillars could clearly accelerate the pace of innovation significantly. However, as mentioned earlier. As the pace of innovation accelerates, the disruptive impact on society and the economy grows, constantly leading to the destruction of old businesses and jobs. It is difficult to say whether innovation is better at a faster or slower pace, as there are both positive and negative aspects. This is where another major pillar is needed to sufficiently mitigate the economic and social costs triggered by the disruptive nature of innovation, so that innovation can drive economic growth at full speed. This pillar is a labor market characterized by flexibility and security. Flexibility means that companies can fire employees and control costs with relative ease because of creative destruction, constant business disruption, deteriorating performance, and even bankruptcy. At the same time, new businesses and successful innovative companies are constantly in need of new employees. Flexibility ensures that these companies can easily attract talent. Security, on the other hand, refers to the inevitable unemployment caused by creative destruction. The government provides decent unemployment insurance for the unemployed for a period of time. If necessary, the government provides skills training to help the unemployed adapt to new industries and jobs as quickly as possible. The government can also help the unemployed by providing job information and facilitating job placement to help them transition to new positions. Unfortunately, these pillars are not yet in place in Japan. As a result, the prospects for innovation-driven economic growth to get back on track remain slim. Japan's current economic and financial system was essentially designed to support the accumulation of war power during the full-scale invasion of China in 1937 and the early years of the Pacific War in the 1940s. The government encouraged national savings to support the war effort. By controlling and intervening in a limited number of banks, the government directed credit funds to large monopolies engaged in the production of various war materials, such as heavy weapons and ships. These large corporations were employed for life. After Japan's defeat, the war-supporting economic and financial system remained unchanged and continued to support the aforementioned Japanese model of economic growth, the wild goose chase. Through direct or indirect control. The government used large banks to lend money at low interest rates to a few large companies to support their technology imitation, introduction, and deployment. These companies also provide lifetime employment guarantees for their employees. It is important to recognize that this focused approach to growth was clearly very effective during the period of growth under the goose and gander model. From why Japan's growth model has been slow to shift to an innovation-driven model. Part Two, author Jaisai Xian, contributing economist, China Briefing. This is China Briefing. Xi Jinping's undisclosed speech: the lesson is too profound. The South China Morning Post reports that as early as 2013, President Xi Jinping determined that China had no choice but to pursue self-sufficiency in key technologies and said that China could rely on the socialist system to seek technological superiority. According to a new book of internal speeches revealed publicly for the first time, in a 2013 speech to the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference (CPPCC) Science and Technology Congress, she said that China's growth over the past three decades had been achieved by importing and using foreign and second-hand technologies from the last industrial revolution, which would put China at a disadvantage. 
sticking to the old path will not only result in a widening technological gap compared to the world's advanced level, but will also plunge to the bottom of the global industrial production value chain. She said in his speech. The speech is included in a book titled, On Self-Reliance and Self-Empowerment in Science and Technology, a collection of she speeches on the topic between 2013 and 2022. The US and Europe set the rules for artificial intelligence and other new technologies, but disagree on the Chinese threat. In the context of increasingly fierce competition for overall national power, we have no choice but to follow the path of independent innovation. She said. Public discussion of economic security in China has become increasingly important in recent years, after the US-China tech war and Washington's restrictions on technology exposed the risks of relying on key supplies from overseas. The internal speech was delivered by Xi on March 4, 2013, just 10 days after he was elected president of China. At the time, state media covered the CPPCC meeting, but only a summary of Xi's speech had previously been released. The transcript of Xi's speech reveals for the first time the way the leader of the world's second-largest economy thinks. Xi's message of technological self-sufficiency and China's control of core technologies is a consistent theme in the book. History shows that a large economy does not mean a strong economy. If a country continues to lag behind other countries, the fundamental reason is that technology lags behind, she said. Xi's speech came years before the U.S. imposed sanctions on Chinese technology companies such as ZTE and Huawei, and after Washington imposed broad export restrictions on China's access to advanced chip technology, further proving Xi's point. In his 2013 speech, Xi also appeared to refer to China's century of shame, saying that China's technological backwardness is why it is bullied by other major powers the lesson is too deep. This lesson is too profound to be forgotten. We must remember it. He said. In his speech, she called on the nation to pool resources to help make breakthroughs in key technologies, while praising the strengths of China's socialist system, which he said has allowed the country to pool our strengths to do great things. In the past, we have relied on this to successfully develop our nuclear weapons, missiles, and artificial satellites. In the future, we will also rely on it to drive innovation, she said. In 1960, China successfully test-fired its first domestically produced ground-based missile under the direction of accused communist Qian Shuesen. Qian returned to China after the accusations, participated in China's nuclear bomb tests, and led a working group that built and launched China's first artificial satellite. Most of the speeches and articles in the book have been previously released by Chinese state media. The full text of Xi's speech at a 2016 cybersecurity conference was republished, in which he urged China's big tech companies to join forces to form a Chinese version of the so-called microenglish ecosystem, as U.S. tech giants Microsoft and Intel did in the 1990s. One of the major reasons why China is falling behind is that our key companies have not achieved the synergy that Microsoft, Intel, Google and Apple have, she said at the Cybersecurity and Information Conference. Here's the China briefing. Li Shangfu says China absolutely will not give up force against Taiwan. China's defense minister said Thursday that Beijing will absolutely not give up the use of force to unify Taiwan and mainland China and will not tolerate Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party seeking independence from other countries, the South China Morning Post reported. Defense Ministry spokesman Tan Kefi recalled to reporters what Chinese Defense Minister Li Shangfu said during a meeting with Singaporean Defense Minister Huang Yonghong earlier in the day. In a rare move, the Defense Ministry mentioned the pro-independence DPP by name in the statement, while reiterating Beijing's position against ruling out the use of force. The defense ministry last mentioned both issues in a statement last December in response to the Pentagon's release of its annual report on Chinese military forces. We will continue to strive for peaceful reunification with the utmost sincerity and the greatest effort, Tan Kefi said Thursday. But we will not tolerate attempts by the DPP authorities to seek foreign support for Taiwan's independence, 
and we will not tolerate outside forces using Taiwan to contain China. We will absolutely not commit to renouncing the use of force. The statement, in which China and Singapore agreed to establish telephone contact on a high-level military dialogue, was consistent with remarks made by Chinese President Xi Jinping at the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China in October, where she began his third term in office. She said at the time that mainland China would continue to pursue peaceful reunification with utmost sincerity and utmost efforts, but will never commit to renouncing the use of force and reserve the option to take all necessary measures. The government also said it would continue to seek peaceful reunification with utmost sincerity and maximum efforts, but will never promise to renounce the use of force and reserve the option to take all necessary measures. Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen who is completing her second term in office, has been barred from running again. As a result, the DPP has nominated Vice President Lai ching te to run for office, who supports the view that Taiwan is a sovereign and independent country that does not belong to the People's Republic of China. Taiwan is China's Taiwan and the Taiwan issue is a core interest of China, said Tan Kefi. Zhou Chenming, a researcher at the Yuanwang Military Science and Technology think tank in Beijing, said, Li's remarks were aimed not only at warning Washington and Taipei against promoting the Taiwan independence movement, but also at reminding Southeast Asian countries not to be used by the United States in dealing with the Taiwan issue. The U.S. always wants ASEAN countries to do something for Taiwan or stand with it to contain Beijing on the Taiwan issue. Therefore, Beijing should firmly reaffirm its position. Li Shangfu is leading a Chinese delegation of dozens of senior military officers and defense experts to Asia's largest defense conference, the Shangri-La Dialogue, which begins Friday. Li Shangfu will speak for the first time at this forum and is scheduled to talk about China's new security initiative on Sunday. Here's the China briefing. Rubio asks DOJ to investigate possible perjury of TikTok CEO. The Hill reports that Senator Marco Rubio, Republican Florida, has asked the Justice Department to investigate perjury by TikTok CEO Shou Zichu, who said in a letter to the Attorney General that Chu lied during sworn testimony that the platform's U.S. user data is not stored in China. Rubio cited a Forbes report that said the most sensitive data on U.S. TikTok users, including social security and tax ID numbers, is actually stored in China, where the Communist Party has access. Rubio's call comes as several state governments and Congress have implemented TikTok on government devices, citing national security concerns. Here's the China briefing. Chinese airlines take new U.S. flights to avoid Russian airspace. The Globe and Mail Canada reports that Chinese airlines are bypassing Russian airspace on newly approved flights to and from the United States, according to flight tracking website FlightAware and industry officials. It is unclear whether Chinese airlines are being asked to avoid Russian airspace as a condition of approval for additional U.S. passenger service. Here is the China briefing. Ukraine, tragic new footage from Kiev as Russian ballistic missiles kill civilians. Three people, including a child, are dead after a Russian ballistic missile attack on Kiev, according to the Daily Telegraph UK. A nine-year-old girl and her mother died, as did a 66-year-old man. Twelve other people were injured. Ukrainian authorities say the country's air defense system intercepted all ten missiles. Russia is believed to have used the Eurasian Economic Union to break Western sanctions, so the sanctions have increased the importance of trading entities in maintaining the front and the Russian economy. The contribution of the Eurasian Economic Union was discussed in a recent issue of Ukraine, the latest, the Daily Telegraph's daily podcast. Here's the China briefing. The world needs you, Biden tells Air Force grads. President Joe Biden warned Air Force Academy graduates that they will face an increasingly unstable world with challenges from China, Russia and climate change, Reuters reported. Biden said the United States will not abandon its support for Ukraine and emphasized his commitment to NATO strength and unity, adding that Sweden will become a member of the military bloc. The United States does not seek conflict or confrontation with China. 
China and the United States should be able to work together where they can to address some global challenges, such as climate, he said. Here is the China briefing. Are warnings about artificial intelligence exaggerated? In a letter to the New York Times, the CEO of Silicon Valley Labs said that while he agrees that artificial intelligence, AI, could be an existential threat, its ability to perform higher-order cognitive functions, particularly creativity, is limited, the Times reported. While the debate rages over how soon highly intelligent computers capable of autonomous, intelligent decision-making will become a reality, the CEO argued that computers lack the human emotional or noun capabilities that allow them to create. So far, he says, AI has proven successful in quantifiable tasks. Examples include ChatGPT answering questions because the results are preloaded with a priori knowledge. While computer programs exist for creating paintings, he said, the artifacts are imitations, not original works. However, the industry's commitment to self-regulation has come under scrutiny. While tech companies such as OpenAI have vowed not to develop deadly autonomous weapons, some question the validity of that commitment without an outside body to enforce it. Here's the China briefing. Why a thaw in U.S.-China relations seems out of reach. The New York Times reports that a series of recent meetings between the United States and China appear to indicate that after months of controversy and a freeze in high-level contacts, the two countries are trying to reduce tensions in order to prevent the possibility of accidental or other forms of conflict. First, U.S. National Security Advisor Jack Sullivan met with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi in Vienna in May. Then, senior business officials from both countries met in Washington, the first bilateral cabinet-level meeting in months. China's ambassador also arrived in Washington last week, finally filling a post that had been vacant since January. But just as Beijing has returned to the negotiating table on some issues, it has also taken a tougher stance, complicating President Biden's predictions last month of a thaw in U.S.-China relations. China has questioned Washington's sincerity, countering U.S. technology export controls and demanding that sanctions be lifted. This week, the Pentagon said Beijing declined an invitation from Chinese Defense Minister Li Shangfu to meet with Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at a security conference in Singapore. On Friday, a Chinese warplane interfered with a U.S. reconnaissance aircraft over the South China Sea and flew directly in front of it in what the U.S. military called an unnecessarily aggressive act. Drew Thompson, a former U.S. defense official, said, China tends to view engagement with senior leaders as a reward for compliance rather than a vehicle for creating stability or resolving differences. In order to meet with China, you have to conduct the meeting on their terms. The Pentagon called China's refusal to meet at this week's Shangri-La Dialogue Security Forum in Singapore an example of China's worrisome reluctance to open a dialogue on military issues. Li Sangbok has been under U.S. sanctions since he took office as Defense Secretary in March for buying military equipment from Russia. Pentagon officials said the sanctions would not prevent Li from meeting with Austin. But China has argued that sanctions imposed on Chinese officials are an obstacle to improving relations between the two countries. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Mao Ning said Washington should lift sanctions against Li Shanfu and create favorable conditions for dialogue. She reiterated China's position on Tuesday that the U.S. should immediately correct its wrongdoing if it wants to resume communication between the two militaries. Shen Dingli, a professor of international relations at Fudan University in Shanghai, said China wants to meet with U.S. officials without being seen as demeaning. We want to meet on the basis of mutual respect, Professor Shen said. We want the U.S. to lift sanctions and seek compromise through mutual concessions. In recent years, the United States has imposed sanctions on Chinese officials and companies for alleged human rights abuses, technological espionage and a host of other issues. The United States and China have an incentive to seek more stable ground ahead of the annual Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Meeting in San Francisco in November, which will be watched to see if there is a meeting between President Biden and Chinese leader Xi Jinping.
While both governments have expressed a desire to stem the deterioration in relations sparked by the U.S. shooting down of an alleged Chinese spy balloon in February, their motives for doing so have not always been aligned. U.S. officials want to maintain open channels of military communication with China. As last week's interference by warplanes showed, the two countries' militaries regularly patrol disputed areas such as the South China Sea, increasing the risk of accidental conflict. Last Thursday, Austin said some of China's activities in international airspace and waters are provocative. China, for its part, has accused U.S. aircraft and ships of moving too close to its borders. Biden referred to the need to establish guardrails to prevent U.S.-China rivalry from turning into a crisis. But Chinese officials have rejected the proposal as a way for Washington to suppress and suppress China's rise. The U.S. has repeatedly warned of the consequences if China provides lethal aid to its strategic partner Russia, even as Moscow is in the midst of a war in Ukraine. Analysts say bipartisan political moves by the U.S. in response to China could limit the Biden administration's efforts to improve relations. In a commentary last week, the People's Daily, China's main Communist Party newspaper, said the arrival of Chinese Ambassador Xie Feng in Washington on May 23 was a sign of easing tensions. But the article also accused U.S. policymakers of damaging relations between the two countries and said improving relations depends on Washington's willingness to avoid damaging mutual trust, avoiding misunderstandings and miscalculations, and taking concrete measures to fulfill its commitments. Here's the China briefing. Beyond crude oil, is China the ideal partner for Middle East development? The South China Morning Post reports that China has been promoting green energy, finance, infrastructure and information technology to strengthen diplomatic and economic ties with Saudi Arabia, and Professor Wang Yiwei of Renmin University of China predicts that China could play a key role in helping Saudi Arabia switch from conventional to renewable energy sources. His comments were echoed by Peking University professor Cha Daojiong, who noted that renewable energy is an area that Saudi Arabia pursues and where Chinese capabilities can be fully adapted. Here is the China briefing. The Trouble with China's Global Civilization Initiative Diplomat reports that Sophie Richardson of Human Rights Watch says China's new Global Civilization Initiative, GCI, is another example of leaders peddling an attractive-sounding concept that ultimately benefits them. The initiative, unveiled by President Xi Jinping in a recent speech, aims to promote concepts such as peace, development, equity, justice, democracy and freedom without pointing out abuses or imposing values on others, and the GCI is part of a Chinese community of destiny designed to take aim at the current rules-based international order. Despite these seemingly positive sentiments, the true nature of the initiative is self-serving and disarms the rules-based international order. The GCI signals to China's partners in the illiberal world that they can pursue their own interests and prioritize their own voices in international discourse. Here is the China briefing. Japan to expand support for Global South to counter China, Russia. The Japan Times reports that Japan has pledged to increase infrastructure support for emerging and developing countries, known as the Global South, to reduce their dependence on China and Russia for key materials and components for batteries and solar panels. The announcement came after the Group of Seven G7, summit earlier this year, when leaders agreed to create a framework to strengthen the renewable energy supply chain in those countries. The revised strategy also does not mention economic cooperation with Russia, as it has for two years, due to Russia's conflict with Ukraine since 2022. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's government has pledged to increase support for infrastructure in the global south and to increase the use of hydrogen and ammonia. Japan has set a goal to increase the value of orders for infrastructure projects from Japanese companies to $243 billion by 2025. This latest initiative is designed to counter China's continued investment in global infrastructure under the One Belt, One Road initiative. Six Degrees Briefing has a real-time collation and translation system for hundreds of authoritative media outlets around the world.